so our speaker today is Professor Farrell from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the uh, University of California, Riverside. Uh, I tried to memorize his description, but uh, it's really long and full of accomplishments, so I actually had to give up. Um, I'm going to read it to you. Uh, Professor Farrell earned BS degrees in electrical engineering and physics from Iowa State University, uh, and MS and PhD degrees from Notre Dame. Um, while in the autonomous vehicle group at Draper Lab, he received uh, the Engineering Vice President's Best Technical Publication Award in 1990 and recognition for awards for outstanding performance achievement in 1991 and 1993. As I mentioned, he's a professor of electrical and computer engineering at UC Riverside. Uh, and has served on innumerable positions in the IEEE Control System Society uh, and was its president in 2014, as well as the general chair of IEEE CBC in 2012. He's been on the board of the Electrical Computer Engineering Department's Head Association, uh, other innumerable IEEE positions, treasurer, uh, member of the financial committee, fellow committee. Uh, he's the current vice president of the American Automatic Control Council, uh, a leader to watch by, in 2009-2010 by GPS World Magazine, uh, and a winner of the Connected Vehicle Technology Challenge by the U.S. Department of Transportation, DOT. Uh, he's authored innumerable publications and three books, uh, and is a distinguished member of IEEE CSS, a fellow of AAAS, and a fellow of the IEEE. Uh, so, uh, we're really lucky to have him, and excited to see him talk. highway vehicles, and I'm working on uh, accurate and reliable state estimation, and I have a couple slides to explain why. But two current areas of interest are autonomous vehicles and connected vehicles, and uh, both of these require an accurate estimate of the state, and by the state, uh, I mean more than just the vehicle state. So the vehicle state would be position, velocity, attitude, angular rate, acceleration, but uh, we actually estimate much more than that. But we need that because we're uh, trying to control and coordinate the state of, well, control our state, plan our state, but also coordinate in uh, vehicle sharing. We're sharing our information with other vehicles, like in this picture, so that we can uh, avoid something that you might not be able to see. So the vehicle in front can communicate to the back uh, information, and you can coordinate the spacing and the maneuvering of vehicles so that this vehicle doesn't pass and get into a problem with something ahead. Where in uh, vehicles, you can also communicate with the system and then organize the system to do more intelligent things to more optimally route the vehicles, so the change of the signaling so that you get increased safety and throughput. Uh, there's different levels of accuracy that are useful in these applications. And, oops, I'm, my bottom is getting cut off. Uh -huh. All right, uh, we'll see if it gets critical or not. But uh, in the early days, that most people might not remember, we had paper maps. And paper maps were uh, very tedious because if you ever lost track of where you was dead reckoning, if you didn't know what road you were on, it was very hard to figure out where you were on the map. But uh, if you knew where you were to about 100 meters, life was great. You could use the map and you could figure out where you were going. Thankfully, our routing apps came out on phones, and on phones you're actually, uh, is typically around 10 meters, and that's sufficient to know which road you're on. And perhaps you've been driving with uh, your uh, your cell phone directions on something like the I-80, and it will start giving you directions to get onto the I-80, right? And that's because it's confused about which road you're on because of whatever software happened inside there, but most of the time, 10 meters <coughs> is fine. Where when you start getting to connected in autonomous vehicles, you need a higher level of accuracy and a higher level of reliability. And there are terms for this, so the 10 meters we refer to as which road. When you get to one meter, we call that which lane, because you can tell which lane you're at. And when you get down to about a decimeter, you know where you are in a lane. And then you can start using that state to control the actual uh, position and maneuvering of the vehicle. Uh, when you go through and try getting these accuracies, uh, sorry, I'm out of sync what I'm doing, you're using different types of sensors. So the first one is just a human dead reckoning, and uh, 
It was problematic. Or the GNSS, where you, or your cell phone, you're mainly using GNSS. So GNSS is uh, Global Navigation Satellite Systems, which is a generalization of GPS. Uh, but the reliability is in, enhanced in the sense of it's normally correct. Uh, does somebody know how to change the resolution? Because I'm missing enough off the bottom of the screen that when it gets to equations, it's not going to be good. It's not my Mac, it's yeah. you guys' you computer. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. So uh, when you get to connected vehicles where you're at about a meter actually, you're combining the information of the state with the digital map, where the digital map is a high resolution representation of the world because you're trying to control either through the system or talking to other cars where you are or what you're doing in different lanes. So you're bringing in more information, but also the reliability, a higher level of reliability is needed than on a cell phone. On a cell phone, you're a human, you can reason through and decide what's going on. We're here where you're telling somebody else what your state is, they're trusting that state. And it gets even more critical when you get to autonomy. Now that state is driving the car. And so you have human safety uh, in the hands of the state estimate. Thankfully, you have more sensors depending on what you choose to use, but you have to ensure a certain level of reliability because otherwise bad things happen. And this is a, a crash from a, a Tesla autonomous vehicle. And uh, the description that I can get from consumer reports and Tesla press releases, uh, this is a failure of data fusion, where there was a camera on the car and there was radar on the car, and the radar was saying something is there, but the camera didn't see the white truck against a white sky and didn't see anything there, and so it trusted the camera too much as opposed to the radar, and there was a crash. All right, and so this is a failure of sensor fusion. And this is uh, particularly important is people are trying to decide, do I trust autonomy or not? So we're trying to enhance uh, state estimation accuracy and reliability at the same time. And uh, cars have a rich sensor environment. And the framework that I'm going into this in is we're sensor rich. And I'm gonna spend a couple minutes defining what I mean by sensor rich. Because when I was a graduate student, we were concerned about observability. Observability was, do I have enough measurements to estimate the state? And I think now we have the opposite problem. We have far more measurements than we need to estimate the state. We're in a situation where it's, which measurements do I want to use? And an example here is with GNSS. GPS was designed to give you enough measurements guaranteed worldwide to be able to estimate your state. So it only takes four measurements. Normally you can get eight to 10 measurements. So you already have twice what you need. But GPS is modernizing, and as it modernizes, it's gonna have three signals. So instead of 10, I'll have 30 signals. But I also have Galileo, Glonass, Beta, each of which is guaranteed to give observability. So I'm having 50 to 100 measurements when I only need four. There's uh, far more measurements than I need to estimate my state. Beyond estimating my state, I probably want to get some accuracy. I want to achieve some accuracy spec. But I probably still don't need 100 measurements to do it. So which measurements should I use and which should I trust? 
and we can uh, have some pictures to explain this a bit more. Uh, so we have a state, and my state here, so P is position, B is velocity, Q is attitude, and C is uh, calibration factors. So other things that I want to estimate, I don't care about them in terms of vehicle state, but by estimating them I get a more accurate state. So we have a problem of trying to minimize uh, risk, and I'll define risk in a moment, in estimating the state or possibly the trajectory of a vehicle to satisfy a given performance constraint in a signal-rich environment. So I'm going through this, I'm going to define what is signal-rich environment, I'll give a quasi-technical definition. What is the performance constraint that I'm trying to uh, satisfy? How do I quantify risk? And then how do I solve the problem? That's the basic outline of what I'm going to talk through. And the first example of signal rich is uh, vision. So this is an example I took from my colleague, uh, Tassos Marikas. And what he does, he uses just camera and IMU. And so this is one of his pictures from a camera. And every red dot is a feature. So he's using KLT features. He's got several hundred measurements there and he tracks these over time, the green line is the tracking of it over time, and he uses this to minimize the drift in the IMU. So there's hundreds of features, he only needs four to estimate the state, but he uses hundreds anyway, and there could be outliers, because to use these you have to track them from one frame to another, which is a feature association problem. In feature association, you might associate feature I with feature J when it should have went to feature K. So you have an outlier situation. If you use it, you get an error in your state, you also get an error in your covariance. But you're basing your decisions on which measurements to use on the accuracy of your prior. Once your prior is wrong, all your subsequent decisions are wrong. So uh, you're trying to avoid using outlier measurements, but uh, you have to figure out a principled way to do that. So here uh, in cameras, four measurements is su sufficient to achieve observability. Uh, we have significantly more measurements than that, so the underlying question comes down to which measurements do I want to use, right? If I have a spec, which of those hundred measurements or several hundred measurements should I use? All right, and this is the GNSS example that I was just talking about. Uh, if you think it through, you could soon be saying a 50, or four, 50 or more measurements per epic when you need four, and if you start looking at, my pictures over here on the right are looking at uh, so the, the blue curve is the probability of at least, so this is the number of measurements changing. And as I increase the number of measurements, if, I think I assumed, uh, so here's my probability of an outlier is 1 in 20. As I use more and more measurements, my probability of one of those being wrong increases towards 1. And my actually is only increasing as 1 over square root of n, which is the red curve. So if you plot the blue curve versus the red curve, you get this, where you're getting the probability of at least one outlier versus the actually that you can achieve. And so you can see that uh, even if you're using 10 measurements, you have a 40% chance of having at least one outlier and you're getting a bit more than the meter of accuracy. Right? There is an obvious trade-off. You get more accuracy as you use more measurements, but you also get a probability of an outlier. Once the outlier is there, your prior is wrong, and then your subsequent decisions are wrong. So. Uh, uh, that's the picture I just talked about. Uh, all right, so signal-rich environments. The char characteristics that I use to define a signal-rich environment, we have significantly more measurements are available than are required to achieve uh, the accuracy that I need. And each measurement has a non-zero probability of corruption of an outlier. And I've given you at least two examples where that exists. And what is the uh, most, or what is most appropriate? So uh, what is an appropriate risk reward trade-off? I only consider one at this point, but we are interested in what are other uh, good trade-offs uh, and which measurement should be selected. Those are the two problems that we're trying to address. And this came to us because I've done uh, vehicle state estimation for many years. And to get centimeter accuracy with GNSS, you have to do something called carrier phase to get down to centimeters. That involves estimating the integers, which is the number of uh, integers in the when the, sig when the carrier phase gets locked, there's an unknown number of integers. If you estimate it correctly, you get centimeter accuracy. If you estimate it wrong, you think you have centimeter accuracy, but you're really off by some integral number of wavelengths. And then your state is wrong, but it's very confident in its wrong answer, and you're trying to avoid that situation. All right. So let's talk about our performance spec. 
I usually deal with highway vehicles, and the person will come to me and say, we want horizontal accuracy of a meter with 95% probability. That's the normal way that a spec is given. And if you think of that in terms of the uh, Chebyshev inequality, you have something like the uh, theorem up on the uh, left there. And you can boil that down to and think it through and come up with, uh, I'm picking two parameters, alpha and beta, and the covariance. And the alpha and beta come from this thing in the middle there where uh, I can guarantee, or I can pick alpha and beta using the formula on the bottom so that if x is less, x, x less than alpha i will be achieved with probably one minus beta if I pick sigma to equal those two parameters. So it's easy to go through this side to come up with the spec on the covariance. And the, uh, so j is my symbol for information matrix and the information matrix is the inverse of the covariance. And so using that lower bound I can get, uh, or sorry, using that upper bound I can come up with a lower bound here on the information matrix. I'm going to have to use information matrix because when you go through the optimization problem, the information matrix is what pops out. So usually people give you your spec in terms of covariance, but we need to transform it over here because that's what the math requires. Right? So we're going to be talking about specs on the information matrix. Once I have the spec, I can now set up a optimization problem. All right, and uh, let's take a step back and. So uh, the traditional way of dealing with outliers is uh, you set up an estimator and you choose which residuals you're going to use based on a threshold test. So you say, I'm going to use uh, all measurements whose residual is less than some threshold tau. Uh, these papers in this method, I picked out four papers, but uh, they're optimization based. This is a different perspective of dealing with outliers where there's uh, the approach of uh, <laughs> robust estimation which is the first example there. So this is a pretty famous paper, and it looks at these soft squares as a means of reducing the effects of outliers. All of these don't try to detect an outlier, they just try to minimize the effect that the outlier has on the estimate. So the first one there, instead of using a squared error, they use a squared error for smaller residuals, and after that they use your growth, and so it's called a, a robust estimation method. The next three papers, they something uh, else, and they're very interesting, and they introduce this vector B, and uh, there's, so for me there's M measurements, and B is one symbol per measurement, if B is zero, I'm going to discard the measurement and ignore it, and if B is one, I'm going to use the measurement. So now I can set up all three of these, set up an optimization problem where they're optimizing both X and B. So you're optimizing both over uh, the state that you're trying to estimate X, and B, the measurements I'm going to choose to use. And then they have different criteria for how they choose B. And these method are, methods are choosing the number of measurements to use. So what is the optimal for measurements to use? And we found that interesting, but it doesn't really fit our problem. For me, I have an accuracy spec. I don't care how measurement, many measurements I use, I care that I get horizontal position <coughs> accuracy of a meter at 95%, right? So we wanted to reformulate the problem to make that go through. And I'm going to go through that derivation. There's a linear case and a nonlinear case. I'll start working with the linear case just to explain it, and then we'll move to the nonlinear case. And the solution for the nonlinear case is basically the same as the solution for the linear case, except you have to iterate to find the solution. All right, and our assumptions are standard, so uh, mutually independent uh, prior process and measurement noise, uh, white measurement noise, all those kinds of things. So I, I will derive it for Gaussian, but it extends to non-Gaussian. It just changes the norms that are used. So, uh, all right, one rather technical slide here. So uh, you can start from the map perspective up at the top. You want, so x hat, or sorry, x star is our state, measure, our state estimate. And note that it's a function of b, the set of measurements that I'm going to use. So I'm trying to find the state estimate XK that maximizes the probability of data I have, where I underline the data that I have in red, so we can track it through. So XK minus one is the prior. Uh, UK is my IMU measurement. ZK is whatever I'm using, images or GNSS, and B is uh, the measurements that I choose to use. So first you can break that up into the, prob the multiplication of these three probabilities where the one on the right is the prior probability, the one in the middle is the state transition probability, and the one on the left is the measurement probability. And note that the B only corresponds to the measurements. 
I'm trusting my prior, and I'm trusting my state transition. So then you do a log likelihood to get to the, uh, or take a natural log to get to the third equation. And now we have a sum of costs. So we have a, a prior at this time, and we have a set of measurements at this time. We're trying to find a state estimate that uh, maximizes that for a given B. But I can also change this and then have the same cost function here where it's a function of the state and B. So now I can optimize over the state that's a function of the measurements that I use. Uh, I take it one more step because I'm going to need the second equation uh, in a moment to make some sense out of this. So we're going to start looking at some special cases. Uh, there are some cases that are very easy to think through. So the first one is, so this should be the summary of all the things that were on the previous slide. So uh, I don't think I, so at this point I didn't list the constraint. Okay, so the top right hand there is the posterior information matrix, which is the prior JK minus plus the information that I get from the measurements. And I did forget to define phi. So, all right, phi. So B is this vector, and B the matrix that's the diagonal of that vector, which is going to be important because Bs are one zeros, so this is an identity matrix with some of the diagonal things set to zero, which is important in that next slide that we can do. All right, so if you start out the top equation there, which well, if B is, in, is zero, then looking at the top right equation, the posterior is the same as the prior. I didn't get any new information. And also, it wipes out the first term of the cost function, and then I can choose x to be xk minus, and my cost is zero. It's zero risk. I didn't use any measurements, so there's no risk, but I didn't gain any information, right? So it's not a very useful solution. Each bit that I turn on increases the cost, right? Because I'm adding in another term over here. So every time I turn on a bit, I'm getting increased risk, but I'm getting increased information. So it obviously shows the trade-off that we get. We increase risk, but we increase information. If we think of the standard common filter without any uh, residual checking, that's B equal to one, right? And you go through the equations and this is the solution. This is the common filter measurement update in, co in information form. And you can think of that as it's maximizing the expected performance, but it's also maximal risk. It's used every measurement. If you had 100 measurements, it used 100 measurements. We want something in between those that's selected in an optimal way. And so you can set up this problem where you're trying to minimize the cost function, which is the risk over X and B, where we have this performance constraint. If I don't put the performance constraint, it's going to pick B equals zero. That's the minimum risk that you can achieve is don't use any measurements. Here I'm forcing it to use some measurements, but to stop when it satisfies my performance spec. So that's what I want it to do. I don't want it to use four measurements. I want it to satisfy my spec. And this is the expected performance. And now you can think of uh, what this does and does not do. So the optimal solution, uh, you know, like this is the standard test. If a residual is less than some threshold, use it. Otherwise, not. And this does not do that at all. If you just use the measurements less than a threshold, you may or may not satisfy your spec. There's no guarantee you do, and there's no guarantee you don't. You may satisfy your spec, but take on far more risk than you have to to meet that spec. Right, you might be using measurements that you don't have to. You've already achieved your spec. Also, it does not use this, it may not use the smallest residual because I've shown you a picture here where this residual is small, but this one is much bigger. If it were to use this one and have to use that one, that could be higher cost than just using two medium-sized residuals. Right? So it may completely ignore the smallest residual. It may choose to use two in the middle. You know, it's just trying to minimize the risk to satisfy the spec. So this is the uh, problem we're trying to solve. And we can do this with either a nonlinear or a linear model. Right, uh, you know, this uh, we can talk about solving, but this I can solve by the same method I did by this, by just iterating, right? I can linearize this and I have this problem and keep doing that until it solves the problem. So we actually do do this for nonlinear problems. Most of our problems are nonlinear. All right, so different ways to solve this problem. All right, so it is a binary optimization problem because B is binary, X is real. So it's mixed, and so you can solve it in steps. One approach is, uh, so you can solve the two problems independently. 
Uh, so uh, here we'll write this problem. Usually the way it works is for a given B, you solve X. For that X, you pick B's, and you keep iterating until it converges. And so uh, one way is to do the binary approach to a full exhaustive search. Well, there are B to the M combinations. When M is 100, that's infeasible. But it would find the uh, global lowest risk solution. And it, if it's feasible, it will find the feasible lowest risk solution. And this kind of pencils out an approach to find that. But as your number of measurements gets high, this is not feasible. All right, we have solved it for small problems. It does find the uh, lowest risk feasible approach. All right, uh, okay, so we don't really care if it finds the lowest risk. We care that it finds a low risk feasible solution. And so you can set this up as a greedy optimization problem where if you uh, think through what's going on here. So here I take a, okay, if, the, if we have a diagonal constraint. So you, you work through your steps here uh, and work down and you get to, so with a diagonal uh, performance constraint, you get down to the simplified problem. So if you bring this over to the other side, then you're trying to pick this to be greater than this minus that, right? And now you can go at that in a greedy approach and get a very uh, nice feasible solution, or sorry, a very fast, I'm saying feasible in two different senses, computationally feasible solution, or each time through you, you uh, first find the dimension with the smallest information, and then you choose the measurement that gives you the most information in that direction. This converges in like four steps, so it's very quick. But then you have to locally search around that solution because there may be a better solution nearby. So this converges quickly. It's very computational, computationally feasible. It does find a feasible solution if it exists. It's low risk, but it might not be the globally lowest risk. But this works, and it's computationally feasible. Another approach is to do a relaxation. So to say that B is a real number between 0 and 1, but it doesn't have to be at the two ends of that loop. And now you can do uh, F min con or such things. And uh, there are papers showing that this will converge, and it does converge, and we've solved this for fairly big problems. Uh, and it works. And you can actually interpret this nicely where uh, up there, I can't quite point to it, you have sigma squared, B divided by sigma squared. If you invert that, that's the covariance of the measurement. So you would think of B as being an ampl amplification of the noise based on the size of the residual where you're discounting the measurement. All right, so you can interpret this in a way that makes it nice, and we solve this. You can also, through some manipulations, you can convert this into a problem that can be solved by branch and bound. Currently, that's the best method that we know, and it works great even for big problems. But, uh, I don't have a slide on that yet, but you, you can convert and solve this by branch and bound. All right, so some results on how this actually performs. So uh, in this, we have a, a GPS INS setup that we took out and we drove around. This is showing the trajectory of how we drove, which is there's a centered uh, sea cert at Riverside, and they have cars. So we strapped on a car and basically drove the streets back and forth to get data. And the hardware setup is important to understand. So we have two different systems on the car. So at the top, we have a consumer grade antenna a cheap GPS and a cheap IMU, because the cheap GPS and cheap IMU are the type of things that would be on a car. And we use those for the state estimation results I'm going to show you, but we need something to compare that with. We're not at a low location, we're moving around. So we put an expensive, so this is the expensive GPS and expensive IMU in the black box, and that's the stuff at the bottom. It's a two frequency receiver, it's very high performance, and from that we get our ground truth. So in the bottom box, we're doing a post-process smoothing of the entire trajectory to get what we consider an optimal centimeter accurate uh, ground truth trajectory, because then we can difference the state estimate using the real-time cheap sensors with the you know, smooth, high-performance stuff so we can see how did we actually do using these things. We purposely drove a section of road. Here you can kind of see trees, but this is about the cleanest road we could find without many trees around because we're going to artificially add outliers, so we didn't want real outliers in it. And that way we're going to be able to study the performance as we change the uh, magnitude of the outliers. So our outliers are going to be produced by a uniform distribution with a mean mu and a width d minus a. 
and we're going to be changing this mu. Right? So we're going to study the performance as we start with very small outliers and keep increasing the size of the outliers to see how the algorithms perform. Uh, I'm going to look at two different estimators. So remind me what time I'm supposed to stop at. Quarter till? Uh, ten till quarter till. Ten till. Okay. So I'm not going to go into this in detail, but two different things. One is a linear estimator. This is the estimator that's in every GPS receiver. It's called a PVA model because the state is position, velocity, acceleration. And you just say that position is the integral of velocity is the integral of acceleration. There's no information between the uh, GPS ethics. You just do that. And that's because it works, in a, it works fine in the receiver and you don't need any extra sensors. So this will be the linear approach. And then, uh, okay, so I guess I present the linear stuff first. Uh, okay, we compare the RACS method, so RACS is what I've been talking about, with the in-person uh, threshold tests, and look at how things compare. So the RACS results are the red graph, and then the, the neon Pearson test with different thresholds is the yellow, green, purple, and black, and the thresholds here are uh, two, three, four, and five, right? Because you can also always choose a threshold to make something look better or worse, so we wanted to show many different thresholds, and this is the uh, mean of the outlier. Right, so what are we showing here? So the top graph is showing the mean horizontal position error, right? And we wanted better than the meter. And if you look at the uh, red graph, it's basically the same performance for all the uh, outlier magnitudes. Where the red, green, purple, black, you see the actually gets worse as the outlier increases and then it comes back down. Well, when the outlier is very small, it's not even an outlier, it's noise, right? It doesn't matter if the outlier is small. And, uh, as the outlier gets bigger, it starts to have effect on the state, but it's hard to detect. But when it gets very big, it's easy to detect and it gets ruled out. So all of them get the same performance at the end because by the time the outlier is 14 meters in size, it's easy to detect and they're all detecting it. Where in between there, the one with the smallest threshold does better than the one with the bigger threshold and so forth until they all come back, right? So the yellow, green, purple, black give the kind of performance you expect and the red one is robust, it works. And here it's showing the uh, RAX one always uses a lower percentage of the measurements than the others, because the others are using everything that passes its threshold where this is stopping when it satisfies the spec. All right, so it's using less measurements, but it's satisfying the spec, but it achieves a better performance, even though it's using lower measurements to <coughs> removing the outliers. Uh, I had to define some stuff there. So some things we want to look at. So this is the actual achieved accuracy, horizontal. Uh, this is the risk, you know, where we're weighting the size of the residual by the B. And then this is uh, how much information you think you have, right? Because this is H, the measurement matrix, times the measurements you use. So this is how much information you think you have. But you can think you have better performance and still have worse performance if you have outliers. And so the next graphs are looking at that effect. So here we're, uh, we're comparing those things. And uh, okay, the difference here is different outlier magnitudes. So this one's a smaller outlier, and this one's a bigger outlier. When it gets big, they all perform the same because it's easy to detect. But this is showing uh, the red one, which is RACS, thinks it has less information than all the others, but it has the lowest risk because it's minimizing risk, but it has the best performance because it's doing a better job eliminating outliers. So even though it, it knows it has less information, it's getting better performance because it's got lower risk of outlier conclusions. All right, and uh, we also do this for a uh, nonlinear estimator, where the nonlinear estimator is GNSS and INS. The INS, uh, you're using more information, so you're gonna get better information because, or because your state propagation is informed by the IME measurements. So every time you carry through, you have more information to do things with, and I'm not gonna go into the details of the equations. All right, and we see similar results. This is the same thing. We take that data and we change the magnitude of the outliers. Uh, the performance is better for all of these because they all have more information, but we see the same trends. Uh, the the RACS is robust to the outlier magnitude where the uh, other's performance depends on the size of the outlier relative to the outlier magnitude, and we see the same trends here. It has uh, less information, lower risk, and a better horizontal performance. 
All right, and I'm going to skip some graphs. There's some tables here of results showing similar stuff. We've also done this over a, a moving window. So in a moving window, you keep more data. And the reason is we're trying to protect our prior because once the prior is wrong, all your decisions are wrong. And so by keeping more data, we have more measurements to choose from in order to make sure we get a lower solution. And you can solve this kind of problem. The math here is similar to uh, uh, MPC or receding horizon estimation or SLAM. The, the, these equations end up being very similar and you can go through and solve the whole problem and those kind of things and you get a similar set of graphs. So we have done this over a time window. All right, I'm gonna skip this. You can also do a better job estimating by keeping this time window. Uh, and this is because of observability issues where you can uh, estimate your attitude and your biases as soon as the vehicle. So this is the time window stuff. This is the first paper I know of that looks at a time window and this is Jez Winsky in the filter and his graph here is showing the common filter diverges but if I keep a window of data, it works, which is the same concept as SLAM or repeat receding horizon estimation. So that's the first paper I've found so far that looks at that. In the control literature, this is called receding horizon estimation and has a history back to at least that 68 paper, plus it's very well used in the chemical process literature. And this cost function looks very similar to the cost function that pops out in our equations. And this is the same math that happens in the slime literature. And the slime literature is uh, very interesting. I'll skip most of this, but when you, you know, there's different, different assumptions and thoughts about what's gonna work best when you start out in the 87 and 90 to what they're doing now. And these have great algorithms. I know the controls guy reading this, the, the algorithms are great in the mathematics. Is great. They really do a nice job of figuring that all out. And this is just saying there's many other sensors that we could be considering that we haven't even gotten to yet where most vehicles today are driving based on these things. There's very good reasons to bring in an IMU and there's many other signals that could be used for free. All right, and I'll stop at this point. Uh, I believe I've said most of this. Uh, uh, sensor, so computation and sensors are dropping in costs and they're increasing in capability. Uh, we have far more information than we need to solve the problem, but doing it in a principled way to get reliable and accurate measurements is critical to people trusting the vehicles that we're designing for them to get into. And there are lives at stake. I think there's great opportunities here for algorithms and uh, doing nice things, and that's the mathematics that we're all working on, right? So I think there's lots of opportunities. I'll stop here if there's any questions. That would be great. Yes. Uh, so can you go back to the slide rate compared? It looks like there's sort of a, a minimum for the brand performance at an outlier magnitude two. Is that significant or not? I've never figured out why that dips. In, but I think the same thing happens out here at this other one. Yeah, yeah. there's actually a minimum there. And I have no idea why. All right. I, I, of course, ask the same reason. You know, I like this one's a little cleaner than the last one, but so far we have no explanation. But since it reoccurs in different applications, there should be a reason. Thanks. Yeah. Could you go back to the slide where you compared uh, your, your method to the common filter? I, I wanted to better understand how how, how this risk inverse approach uh, collapses. Yeah. So I think a good place to start is here. I'm, uh, do you agree with my conclusions there about B equals to zero? Like if B is zero, this whole term gets wiped out, right. right? And then you just have this, which I can solve by setting X equal to X minus. So my risk is zero, which it should be because I haven't used any measurements. And the whole second term there is wiped out because I didn't get any new information, right? And uh, I don't even know if I repeated this equation. Yeah, I did. So with B equal to one, I have that whole term without even a B in it, and I have that whole term. This is just a common filter. And you can solve this, and you will get this equation. All right, and the main reason I'm putting this here is to show you why I'm doing this in information form. I do get this out in information form. Right, and there I am getting the information form. So I have to work with information form rather than covariance. What, what are the weights on the norms, PK minus and RK? 
Oh, okay. Uh, that's a notation. So uh, let's go back two slides. So when you use uh, when you use Gaussian noise, so the main thing you get from Gaussian noise is you're going to have uh, let's take this one, the prior. So the prior is uh, x k with covariance p k, right? So in the exponent, you're going to have x minus x k minus one p k inverse x minus x k minus one, right? And that quadratic is this thing here. I didn't write down the definition of that norm, but it just means it's the quadratic with pk inverse in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I, I understand what the notation means. I, okay. I was wondering what the physical interpretation is. It, is it the covariance on the process noise and measurement noise? Yes, so p is the covariance on the prior, and r is the covariance on the measurement. Okay. Okay. And I think I... So we got oops. What we got here, yeah, so it's still here, but it pops up here, and then it's goes there, which is just the solution. This is just the solution to that. This is a quadratic optimization you solve. Okay. And then the other question I had was on, uh, when you're talking about relaxing the binary constraints, yeah. you said there's an interpretation of it discounting some, yeah, some, can, some measurements. And you can even see it here. So if B is 1, so if, if we assume R is diagonal, then R is the diagonal of sigma I squared. Yeah. Right? Well, if it was if it was sigma I squared divided by b, you would get that term there, right? And then you can think of that as I'm amplifying the noise because b is always less than one. So if the residual is big, the mathematics is going to amplify sigma squared by sigma squared divided by bi, right? That's you know the mathematics doesn't do that. That's when you look at it, you can interpret it that way. Right. So, so then in practice, when you relax those binary constraints and, and apply it, then are you using all the, 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 the measurements, but then you're just using a value for bi that's not 0, 1, and it's essentially not amplifying the... Yeah, the, and that's the how we came up with that. You know, it's like, okay, once, once so you solve that problem, uh, what are you going to do, right? And there's a section in the paper here that we talk about this, about... You could say, okay, it's going to optimize B, and hopefully it's going to get BIs near 0 and 1. Mm -hmm. Well, then we could just say those round them to the nearest integer and either use them or not use them. But then that's no longer optimal for with a solve. If you just use them as real numbers, how do we interpret that? Right. And our interpretation was we're going to think of sigma I over B as this, the optimized standard deviation. I see. But you know, the math is just solving a math problem. Right, right. In one of your slides where you were um, alternating between the non-linear world and the linear world, so you mentioned linearizing the H, um, I think it was the H uh, observer, and then maybe even the dynamics, so that's reminiscent of the extended gamma filter. And is there any, pr any preserved quantity that can be claimed in between the two? Well, so, uh, most of the I stick with this because it's easier to talk about. But you know, in the nonlinear problem, you're minimizing this instead of this. So you solve a nonlinear problem, you linearize, right? And you solve it linear and you keep iterating until it converges. Uh, so it is interesting the relation to the common filter. Because the common or sorry, the extended common filter, the extended common filter basically does one iteration. Right? The iterated common filter, the iterated extended common filter, you iterate many times. Right? So really that that's kind of what this is, right? Except you're also selecting your measurements, right? And then when you do it over a window, it's something different, but that relates to slam and RHE, right? Where you're selecting which measurements you use, right? But I do think that's a good way, I forget, I was talking to Mark earlier about extended column. <laughs> to me, it is a nice way of teaching, because I was never taught the iterated extended common filter, but once I learned it, it does work very well when your measurements start out bad, right? And it is easy to go from here it extended to iterate extended and to understand what they're really doing. Right. Yeah? What if my uh, measurement noise model is not Gaussian? Yeah, I mean, okay. So I, I really like the Bayesian formulation because all of a sudden it kind of pops out. So your second step here would still be correct, right? Because all that this did was assume that things were independent. 
But when you take log, you're going to end up with a different cost function on the third line. So like if you assume Laplacian, that would be one norms instead of two norms. Right? So it's really only changing the last step, which is the nonlinear function you're optimizing. Everything else works. Right? So yeah, different noise models still work. They may be less pleasant to work with because <laughs> this is a quadratic. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Then you might not get the information matrix popping out. Good question. All right. Anything else? All right. Good audience. You guys had great questions. Great. That's uh, that's what we'd like to present you with the gift. Thank All right. Thank you. 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 Thank you.